Good evening. I'm Larry Temple. As chairman of the OBJ Foundation, it is my privilege to welcome all of you to the presentation of the OBJ Liberty and Justice for All Award. Let me, at the outset, tell you something about the award. Lyndon Johnson's basic creed was epitomized in the following simple but insightful statement from his 1965 voting rights speech in which he said, our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country, to right wrong, to do justice, and to serve man. Lyndon Johnson at his core believed that every citizen of this country should have the opportunity to enjoy the benefits and to receive the protections that are fundamental to our democracy. That is what motivated him to pursue the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act. That is why he championed Medicare and Medicaid. That is why he sponsored the landmark education legislation. That is why he established the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. That is why he insisted on the passage of the Clean Rivers and Clean Air Laws, the laws expanding our national parks, and the myriad other environmental laws that resulted in historian Doug Brinkley labeling him as the equal of Theodore Roosevelt in preserving our environment. LBJ's belief in equality was the very foundation of all of his great society programs. The LBJ Foundation created the LBJ Liberty and Justice for All Award to recognize individuals who, in their own way and in their own time, are carrying on LBJ's legacy of opening the doors of opportunity for all of our citizens. Among the previous recipients are President George H.W. Bush, President Carter, and that lion of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, Congressman John Lewis. The man we honor tonight has already written his immutable place in the history of this country. You will hear more about him in a minute from Ben Barnes. The award will be accepted tonight by Megan McCain on behalf of her father, John McCain. All of you know her as a prominent television personality who is co-host of The View and regularly appears on many other television programs. She's also an American columnist and author. The award will be presented to her in a little bit by Linda Johnson, Rob, and Lucy Johnson. After remarks by Megan McCain, our own Mark Updegrove, formerly director of the LBJ Library and now the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation, will lead a conversation with Megan McCain and Rick Davis. Who is Rick Davis? <laughs> Rick Davis has for many years been Senator McCain's chief strategist and political advisor integral in the development of key legislative initiatives, including groundbreaking climate legislation and campaign finance reform. He served as the national campaign manager for Senator McCain's presidential runs in 2000 and 2008, and was in charge of all campaign activities. He unquestionably has been, and continues to be, Senator McCain's closest confidant. So the conversation with the three of them will give us uh, illumination about Senator McCain. Before you hear more specifically about Senator McCain, I would note that there's an extensive background of the relationship between the McCain family and LBJ. Senator McCain's father, Admiral John McCain Jr., served with distinction and great acclaim during LBJ's presidency. In February 1967, he was promoted from vice admiral to full admiral and became commander in chief of all U.S. naval forces in Europe and was stationed in London. That was the year that Senator McCain was captured by the North Vietnamese. In November of 1967, President Johnson received an eloquent letter from Senator McCain's mother. I think that letter is going to be shown on the screen behind me. Let me read it for you. Dear Mr. President, as the parent of a son who was shot down in Hanoi last week and is now a prisoner of war, I wonder if you're interested to know that both my husband and I back you and your policies 100% in Vietnam. 
One reads so much of other opinions that I just hope that you know the people really making sacrifice believe in our country and in you. May God bless you and keep you strong in your courage and convictions. Yours sincerely, Rebecca McCain, and then she writes under it, Mrs. John Sidney McCain, wife of Admiral John S. McCain. President Johnson's letter response to Ms. McCain is also shown on the screen, and I will read it. Dear Mrs. McCain, your most remarkable letter recalls so much of the McCain courage and kindness for me. I had the honor and pleasure of serving with your son's grandfather in the Pacific in 1942. The imprint of his example is still with me, is with me still. It is a part of the great and proud debt your president and your nation owe to your line. Mrs. Johnson and I know in our hearts the anxiety that you and the Admiral must feel for your son. I have asked Ambassador Harriman to handle this sad matter personally. Your hopes could not be in wiser or surer hands. The ambassador will have been in touch with you. You can be certain that you, he will remain closely involved. I pray that the good Lord in his great mercy will be as close to bring you comfort and strength. Our thoughts are with you. Our hands and hearts will be working for you. Sincerely, Lyndon Johnson. So you can see tonight is not the first, but only the latest chapter in the relationship between the McCain family and the Johnson family. So that you'll hear more about it, it is now my privilege to introduce a longtime friend of Senator John McCain, Vice Chairman of the LBJ Foundation, former Lieutenant Governor and Speaker of the State of Texas, Ben Barnes. Thank you, Larry. On Memorial Day, I watched the premiere of HBO's illuminating documentary on Senator John McCain, titled For Whom the Bells Toll. The film shares the same title of Senator McCain's favorite novel by Ernest Hemingway. The work tells the story of Robert Jordan, a young American who enlisted in the fight in the Spanish Civil War after leaving his career in this country as a teacher. During his journey, he met Pillard, a peasant woman who symbolized strength and wisdom. And, Pat, and perhaps one of her greatest quote is a rhetorical question. For what are we born if not to aid one another? Tonight, we have an opportunity to honor the legacy of a man who has dedicated his entire life to aiding others. A man who has served his country and who is one of the finest senators that the United States has ever elected from any state. Our country was built by men like John McCain. Our founding fathers exemplified the values of courage and integrity and optimism, the traits that John McCain embodies. Like John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin, Senator McCain will never serve as our commander in chief, but he's always been on the battlefield of justice, fighting to preserve our democracy. There is no doubt in my mind that the name John McCain will be permanently inked into the history books of this nation as a modern day founding father. We live in a time when politicians make arguments on major networks, not face to face with their colleagues on the House and Senate. Today, money and special interests soften individuals' voices and cause many Americans to walk away, disgusted and distrustful of our government institutions. But to gain one's respect and to be identified as someone with integrity, that's something that you cannot buy with a dollar. The diseases of the mind and the heart, 
that poison the modes of democracy are cured with the values that Senator John McCain embodies every single day. We know who John McCain is. We know him as a voice of reason. We know him as a shining beacon, illuminating the possibilities of our democracy. We know him as a bridge across the partisan divide. We know him as a family man. We know him as one of the most resilient defenders, loyal admirers, and trusted friends that this nation has ever had. And we know him to be someone who has and will always come to the aid of another. He has never forgotten, not one single day, what he's been fighting for. In a most recent book, The Restless Wave, Senator McCain recalls a trip to Burma in 2012, where he'd been campaigning on behalf of a, a democracy activist in that country. And he said in that book, there's nothing so rewarding as contributing, even if only in the most modest way, to the defense of another human being's dignity, all the more so when the person otherwise is a stranger to you. Megan, it is a singular honor to mark this occasion with your attendance here tonight. What greater inheritance could your father give you and your siblings than the example of aiding others? I cannot think of a more fitting location to honor your father than this presidential library. Your father, while firm in his beliefs, never turned down an opportunity to work with someone across the aisle. I remember well his work with my friend Ted Kennedy on the Patients' Bill of Rights. President Johnson once said, and I'll repeat it because Larry has already said it tonight, but there are no problems that we cannot solve together and very few that we can solve by ourselves. Your father understands this concept. For John McCain, it's not about the left's point of view or the right's point of view or about a political party's point of view. It's about moving America forward. Let's look at John McCain's example. Our nation needs him today. In 2018, more than we've ever perhaps needed John McCain. We need his moral compass, which directs him to stand up for what's right, especially when it's unpopular. But when John McCain looks in the mirror each day, I know that he can say with confidence that he fulfilled his oath, he maintained his values, he stayed the course, and aids others at every opportunity. While the Senator is not here tonight, we are truly humbled to honor him with the LBJ Foundation's most prestigious award, the Liberty and Justice Award, whose honor carry on President Johnson's legacy. And as the mission he assigned, defined, as Larry said, to right wrong, to do justice, and to serve man. That's John McCain's example that if we come together and have the courage to stand up for what's right, we can aid others even in the most difficult of times. People who love this country can change it, and together we can take the steps to fulfill the memory and the meaning of our creed that we are one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. If you'll please direct your attention to the screen, we are gonna have a brief clip from the HBO documentary. Uh... I've been tested on a number of occasions. I haven't always done the right thing, but you will never talk to anyone that is as fortunate as John McCain. Good morning, good morning. How are you, my friend from TMZ? If you want to really know him, his favorite book is For Whom the Bell Tolls. The protagonist in that goes to fight in a war that's a hopeless cause, and yet he gives his life for it. 
a missile took the wing off the airplane. The Army came and they took me to a prison camp and one of the interrogators, he said, things will be very bad for you now, McCain. I was always looking the next step down the road. McCain was always willing to break the mold he was in if it was clearly the right thing to do. And that's an invaluable commodity. I thought I was gonna whip him. Of course, he thought he was gonna whip me. McCain has an authentic inner voice. Even when he compromises for political reasons, he knows he's compromising some piece of himself. For John to say, we're all Americans, we're all on the same team, I thought was an indication of who John fundamentally was. We need to give the American people what they deserve, and right now, they're not getting it. The Arizona senator has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. John, throughout his life, has been heroic. If he showed us how to live, he's also it's also showing us how to die. I stand here today looking a little worse for wear, I'm sure. We're getting nothing done. The measure of the man is how he responds under adversity. And look at John. I've had 60 years in service to this wondrous land, and I am so grateful. Linda and Lucy, if you would please join Megan here at the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome the 208 Liberty and Justice Award recipient, accepting on the behalf of her father, Megan McCain. Megan. I'm going to walk by this microphone because I simply cannot resist the desire to say on behalf of generations of Johnsons how thrilled we are, how deeply honored we remain that we have a chance to express to your father how much we admire him, how grateful we are for him. He is indeed what liberty and justice for all is all about. And to give him this highest honor that the LBJ Foundation has is indeed a great honor for us because his service for our family and for our nation can simply not be matched. Let him know we're cheering for him. Thank you so much. You are both so kind. Um, I get choked up watching the HBO movie every time I watch it, so please excuse me. Every time I think I'm not going to, I've seen it quite a few times. and. It's hard to watch. Um, I am absolutely honored to be here. Thank you so much. The amazing um, historical connection between our families, as you saw with my grandmother, Roberta, and your father is incredible. You come from a big Democratic family. I come from a big Republican family. Bipartisanship can still exist in America, and I feel very hopeful tonight about that. This award in particular is about liberty and justice, which are values that we as Americans, no matter which side you're on, all believe in, all agree with. I wish my father were here tonight more than anything. It is hard for me to come and accept awards on his behalf because, well, you all understand why. Um, if he were here, I think he would just say it's an absolute great honor to be in this library, to be in Austin with your family and all that your family represents to America. 
I know when I show up instead of my father, you all expect to have a war hero and a very famous, accomplished historical senator, and instead you have a woman who fights with Joy Behar for money in front of you. So I do apologize. It is not up to par. I'm honored to even be speaking for his legacy. My father is obviously a great American hero and all the things you just saw in that clip and all the wonderful things you just said, but he's also an absolutely incredible father. We have a magic relationship. I don't know how he somehow pulled off being the kind of politician and American he was and also at the same time being such a great and amazing father. He instilled in me the beliefs that I think this award represents, liberty and justice for all. And I am grateful to be here representing him. And I really, really wish he could be here. I hope this is a hopeful night of optimism and coming together for America. We are living in such intensely divided and ugly times. And I hope tonight it can be a representation like we saw in those letters between my grandmother and your father, that we as Americans still are together in it, believing in the same values and living in the same country. So thank you very much. I'm deeply touched, and my father and my mother are also deeply touched as well. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to speaking with Rick Davis, who I know very well, even if no one else in the room does. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome to the stage Rick Davis and Mark Updegrove, who will engage in the conversation uh, with Megan McCain. Thank you. Thank you. I should say, Rick Davis is my father's longtime campaign manager. Can you hear me? Longtime campaign manager who I've known since I was 12. And um, uh, the difference between, I think, my family's uh, relationship with politics is that every one of my father's campaign on his staff are my family, whether they like it or not. And you're involved with every drama, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and um, yeah, you are the architect behind my father's political career. So that's why he's here. Well, we're delighted mm -hmm. to have you, uh, Megan, and, and Rick, delighted to have you as well. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to talk about your father's remarkable life. I, you tweeted recently that your mother calls you John McCain in a dress. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can be sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, uh, what, what lesson have you learned that is most indelible from your dad? Um, oh my God, there's, I mean, I couldn't even possibly quantify. There are so many lessons that I've learned from my father, but right now at this particular moment in time and particular moment in my life, which is very, it's filled with darkness for all the obvious reasons. My father's battling a very serious brain cancer. There's a lot of negativity and strife going on in the country. You can't have a conversation with one person on one side or the other, but it's more that we have to adhere to our better angels, that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're still Americans, that we still ultimately want the same thing. And it's very easy, even for me, to go to my side of the tribe and be like, me as a Republican, I believe this and I can't talk to you. And I always remember the type of man that my father was and ha or is and of the type of man that he is as a politician. The, the, uh, there's a, Senator McCain has said we are a product of our values. And Rick, I wonder, if, how would you characterize Senator McCain's values? Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, let me just also say thank you for all of you, uh, uh, the, the Johnson family. Thank you for having us and, and everybody for coming out on a Friday night before the 4th of July week. I yeah. mean, thank you very much. It's always nice to see such a healthy crowd and want to hear more about John McCain. You know, I think one of the things that sets John apart today from a lot of the debate in, in politics is his belief in American exceptionalism and the values that go along with that. He's talked about it a lot in his career, and, and I would say, you know, when, when President Johnson was in office, that wasn't a question, right? Mm. I mean, the extension of American values overseas, our relationship with our allies, and our ability to inspire other people to, to want the same kind of 
uh, uh, future for their children and their, 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 their populations was, was just, a, a, everyone ex adopted that as a, as a truth. Right. Today, that's under attack. And so I think what's most unique about John and his vision is how steadfast he is held to those values and how he tries to keep encouraging uh, the, our leaders of our country, whether they're in Congress or, or in the presidency or in the courts or even in the town halls, um, to, to rise up and, and, and maintain the values that distinguish the United States from literally every other country of the world. How did you come to work for Senator McCain? Uh, well, it was a bit of a, a rocky path. Um, uh, he and I got to know each other in 1996 on Bob Dole's campaign. He was a very close friend of Bob Dole and traveled all around with him during that campaign. And, uh, and I thought after the Dole campaign that it would be inspiring to have a woman uh, to uh, run for office. So I was actually talking to Elizabeth Dole uh, to manage her campaign. Her father called me up and said, hey, I want to talk to you about running my campaign. I said, well, I'm already talking to your friend Elizabeth Dole. I'm really not sure you know, I should be talking to you. And he said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. We're going to have a, a blast. Long story short, um, uh, I decided to join the McCain campaign, and we literally had more fun than you're supposed to be allowed to in a presidential campaign. I'm going to come back to the 2000 campaign and talk about 2008 as well. Uh, but, uh, Megan, your dad is an icon, an American hero, as you said. Thank you. Um, what do we not know about him? Um, He's really fun. I mean, I think that's missed a lot sometimes. He really likes to have a good time. He taught me at a young age how to play blackjack and poker, and he likes to craps. drink vodka and craps, and he just really loves life, and he really loves, as, as Rick knows, almost to his detriment, he loves to be surrounded by friends. Like, he doesn't like to be alone. He really likes being surrounded by a community of people, and he enjoys everything. He enjoys mm. grilling, he enjoys talking with people he loves. The, this, he really gets great joy out of the simple things in life, and he is, I think, a lot more rowdy and a lot more fun than maybe people realize, which, when, if you want to talk about campaigns, um, campaigns are often a reflection of the candidate, and my father's campaign was nicknamed the pirate ship, and I remember um, talking to a friend who worked on the Romney campaign four years later, and they were like, yeah, it ain't nothing like the whiskey-drinking, rowdy plane that your dad had. Um, and I, I always like that about him, because I don't think it's it's not really going to happen anymore. I mean, politicians are so scared of, uh, you know, every tweet, every photo. And um, somebody tweeted me a picture recently of my dad playing craps in MGM. And they were like, are you proud of this? And I was like, of course I'm proud of that. I mean, can you not take a load, load off and play some craps? It's OK. It's America. <laughs> And by the way, he is a damn good craps player. Yeah. <laughs> that guy knows what he's doing around he the table. One of the things that the, 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 uh, is, is central to his story is his service in Vietnam. He was, of course, shot down, captured by the Vietnamese, and spent five and a half years at the Hanoi Hilton, the notorious Hanoi Hilton uh, uh, prison camp in Vietnam, two years of which were spent in solitary confinement. Um, how did that shape him? How did that experience of being a prisoner of war shape your dad? Well, you know, he doesn't talk much about Vietnam. Uh, as a rule, he's moved on. I think he moved on literally the day that plane lifted off and flew into Subic Bay in, in the Philippines. Um, and when I first got to know him, I, he never talked about it. And, mm -hmm. and you would think that would be fundamental as an experience to a future presidential candidate. But um, I think that there's an important aspect to him that um, is, is, is born right out of the Vietnam experience, and that was his love of this country. Mm -hmm. You know, he talks a lot about falling in love with America as a prisoner of war. You know, when, when the freedoms that we are enjoying today are denied you, you then start to appreciate them a lot more. There's an argument to be made that we've been spoiled in America by the, the success and the freedom that we've had, and then once it's denied you, you really start to appreciate it. And, and he was surrounded by, as he likes to say, a thousand acts of love and kindness in prison camp. I mean, it sounds like a horrific experience, but some of the best things that ever happened to John McCain were with his fellow POW prisoners. Talk about that uh, for, for those in the audience who might not know about what that experience looked like. You see in that clip, uh, the senator says uh, of, of, the, of one of his captors, uh, that he looks at him and says, things are going to be very difficult for you, right. uh, Mr. McCain. Talk about why it was difficult. What, what led to that discussion? 
with his captor? Well, um, you know, the, it's a pretty well-known story, but uh, there was an instance where when the, um, the, the guards found out uh, that he was the son of Admiral John McCain, which we heard about tonight, um, they thought they could use him as a pawn of propaganda uh, by releasing him early. And of course, who wouldn't want to get out of a prison camp in Vietnam ahead of schedule? But John's dedication to the military creed and, and his dedication to his fellow prisoners led him to say that no, you know, he would only leave in order of capture, which is the, the, the way the service members are trained to do it. And so unless everybody who'd been captured prior to John McCain were released, he wasn't going anywhere. He chose to stay, denying them this propaganda coup, which then just resulted in even worse torture than he'd been given prior to that. And yet he, he as you pointed out, he, he puts it all behind him to the point where, during the Clinton administration, he lobbies President Clinton to normalize relationships with Vietnam, you, which is a remarkable thing. How does that happen? How, how do you put that bitterness aside and move on with your life so easily? Well, like Mark, as we said, everything that existed that was, was negative to John McCain about Vietnam stayed in Vietnam when he left. You know, and, and, and the healing process that he believed was necessary um, was uh, to go beyond the experience he'd had on the ground. He knew that we would never be able to be whole as a country until we satisfied our need to solve the Vietnam problem. And kudos to Bill Clinton, who called him up and said, I cannot do this without you. Right. I need you to be able to solve uh, normalization of relations. It was a tough decision by John because you're handing a you know, Democratic president who you're in the middle of elections, uh, a great coup. Right. But you know what? This is the best part about John McCain. None of that even had any bearing. He thought it was the right thing to do, and he was over at the White House the day it happened, and, and has become an icon in Vietnam. He's, right. he's like a rock star in downtown Hanoi. It's unbelievable. Right. Um, and, uh, and the only thing he regrets about Vietnam is there's a statue of him <laughs> by the lake where he crashed into. Uh, and and it identifies him as an Air Force pilot, and it really pisses him <laughs> off. <laughs> so that might be the most damning thing the Vietnamese have done to John McCain? Yeah, we went, that's a legacy he doesn't want. We went to visit it, and a man had his bike chained to it, and I was like, this is not good. Like, we gotta get that bike off here so we can see it. <laughs> he never missed, even when he was in Washington, Megan, he never missed a weekend in returning yeah. back to Arizona where you were born and raised. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like to be with your dad on the weekends when, when he was? We would go pick outside. him up at the airport and we would like make signs and I would be, I just remember it was like Disneyland. It was like the best thing ever when he was home. And we would go up to Sedona almost every weekend where my family has a ranch and you know, he would just take us in the creek, take us fishing, just normal dad stuff. And that, I think, is a real testament to him that he was able to sort of compartmentalize mm. his career to be at home and be so present as a father. And I don't know, he just, when people ask me what he was like as a dad, it's like he was amazing, but he was also a normal dad. He cooked for us, he tucked me in, and, you know, disciplined me when I got out of line. And, um... Yeah, I mean, I only have really, uh, miraculously, because I know for just a normal person, it's, you know, people have issues with their parents, let alone if your father's super famous. Right. Um, I had a really normal childhood. I think it's why um, I ended up uh, being more drawn to politics, because I think if I had grown up in D.C., you're sort of ensconced in it, and you, I wouldn't have liked it so much. So I really appreciate the sort of normal childhood my parents right. gave me. Right. But yet, when he throws his hat in the ring for the presidency in 2000, he takes you with him on the, he pulls you out of yes. school, yeah. and he takes you with him on that remarkable when experience. When I was a freshman in high school, yeah. It's kind of crazy when I look back on it, just because, A, I don't think it's like an entirely appropriate environment for a 14-year-old no. girl, 13-year-old <laughs> girl. <laughs> like, unless, you're, yeah. unless you're a McCain child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think he knew that it was such an incredible experience. It has shaped the foundation of my childhood and my youth so much more than anything I ever learned in school. No disrespect to any of my teachers, but right. it was just such a fundamental experience in my life. And weirdly, it's like all these journalists that I remember as a child have gone on to be so relevant now. John Dickerson, Jake Tapper, these are people who were like young, up and coming journalists that now are, you know, obviously on your on your television every day. And 
I don't know, it really made me understand primary politics, it made me understand the media, and it really fostered my love for, for politics. So, uh, what do you remember about that campaign, Rick? I mean, it, 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 uh, if it, if it, it's, it, it I'm wasn't- still in a therapy. <laughs> <laughs> John McCain uh, had a, a bus called the Straight Talk Express. It was an incredibly open uh, uh, and, and accessible environment for, right. a, for a politician. Yeah, but, I can't, but, and it's, I, in, it's sort of a famous campaign. Talk about it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, when John McCain called me to recruit me to run his campaign, he said, look, I want to do everything different. I'm, you know, I don't want a traditional campaign. I don't, that, that's not the way I am. I want to do everything different. And, and at that time, I, I probably didn't quite appreciate how different he really wanted to make things. Um, John McCain is an incredibly uh, intelligent man. I mean, one of the things that people really don't understand about him is his uh, intellectual curiosity. He reads books once a week that are you know 800 pages on the flight home from Arizona. Um, he reads six, seven newspapers a day. He's, he's literally his thirst for knowledge is, is like nothing I've ever seen before. And he has a retention ability uh, that is uh, a little scary. And so we'd, he decided, look, I want total access to the media. And I thought, OK, so maybe something more than an hour a day. Uh, no, 18 hours a day. Uh, we'd get on a bus at 7 o'clock in the morning, the Straight Talk Express. And we would have the reporters that, that Megan identified, young bucks, you know, who are, who are dedicated political reporters who are now the network chiefs of, of most of these mm -hmm. uh, groups. And, and, and they would sit in the back of the bus starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they'd start talking about issues. And at first, it'd be sort of traditional. What's going on in the campaign? How are you going to win New Hampshire? You know, what's going on with your opponents? You know, and then you get to about 11 o'clock, and normally you'd be pulling the bus over to a hotel for everyone to file their stories, and they're like, don't stop the bus! <laughs> you know, we want to keep talking. And, uh, and you know, by uh, 9, 10 o'clock at night, six town halls later, um, they're exhausted, and John's like, hey, we're, we're not stopping now, are we? Um, you know, it's just a bundle of energy. And I remember one instance that um, really uh, affected me, because uh, I was getting to know John during that campaign the same way everybody was. And we're in the back of the bus, it had been an exceptionally long day, and by now, the story of the Straight Talk Express had become sort mm -hmm. of legend. Mm -hmm. and, and people were literally applying to get on the back of the bus, right? We had, we had a lottery to pick people at some point, because we couldn't accommodate everybody. And, um, and, and Mark Halperin, who's a relatively well-known, uh, notorious reporter, uh, was in the back of the bus that day, and he was just convinced he was going to stump John McCain, right? And uh, and you know he wasn't normally on there, so he's in there causing trouble, and he's ha asking a lot of hard questions all day long. And and it was about seven or eight o'clock. We're all hungry. We're trying to find a decent barbecue joint in Wolfboro, Massachusetts, and or New Hampshire, and <laughs> you can't do that in Wolfboro. Uh, and uh, and 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 he says, Senator, you've talked a lot about you know, how much interest you have in Roman history. And he said, you know, wh there's a lot going on in the United States Senate right now. What period of time in Roman Senate history would you equate to the current activity that are going on in the United States? And after an incredibly long day, without missing a beat, he said, well, a precocious period of time during this era and, you know, <laughs> during this AD, you know, and then he gave a very substantive answer about how the two parallels when the Senate was under pressure and it was starting to divide itself and, you know, the, the, the legend of the Roman Senate was under, under attack and, and Halpern just dropped his pad and said, okay, I give up. <laughs> That's it. I'm not asking any more questions. I'm not coming back on this damn bus. Um, it was, and, and, but like... That's because John McCain loved information. He loved history. You know, he, he graduated fifth from the bottom of his naval class, but he was probably one of the brightest people in the, in the, in the academy. And, uh, and he loved to read history. I never knew that story. Yep. It's, uh, it, it's one of my favorite Halpern stories because it made him look so bad. He's such a smart ass. <laughs> I was about to say, he's such a smart ass. <laughs> exactly. You can see him doing it, couldn't you? He wrote Game Change, if anyone wants reference to who that is. Just and, don't read the book. Yeah. <laughs> It's not endorsed by the McCain family. No. <laughs> but the current book, and it's currently available on Amazon, if anybody here is interested. Um, the Restless Wave. Yep, yeah, Restless, Restless Wave. wave. Uh, I have friends who were on that campaign, as I mentioned to you all backstage, and they'll tell you it was one of the most joyous 
experience in their journalistic lives. Let me just take you through the, the, uh, the trajectory of the campaign quickly. Uh, of course, George Bush was the establishment Republican candidate going up against the maverick John McCain. Bush wins the Iowa caucus in, uh, uh, the, the, in, in January, and in February, uh, McCain clobbers Bush in New Hampshire. Then you go on to do 19 points, but who's yeah, counting? 19 19 points. Points. I know we're on Texas turf here, so I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, <laughs> then you go to do or die South Carolina, yeah. which is an incredibly interesting chapter in political history. Talk about what happened there, if you would, Rick. Oh, um, Megan, please. Well, I, I said in the documentary, it's the last time I was innocent in politics was before South Carolina. It's yeah. the last time I was like truly idealistic. Um, there was a shadow whisper campaign. Is that the right way to describe it? Um, robocalls. Robocalls. Yeah. I have an adopted little sister from Bangladesh who obviously, she's from Bangladesh, so she is dark skin. And there was a whisper campaign that my father had a love child from a, a, a I, don't, I never know the real, it's like black, black prostitute. Or, yeah, the, right. It's very disgusting, very dirty, a very, very dark part of American political history. Mm -hmm. It basically torpedoed him in South Carolina, and people believed it. And it is something that took a long time to reconcile between my family and the Bush family. We have, we have and put it behind us. Mm -hmm. um, it's been something that's been very hard for my little sister to deal mm -hmm. with as an adult, because I think when she got older, and you inevitably Google yourself, and it comes up, it's, um, I, think, I think sometimes in politics you forget that like, there are actual people behind things like that and campaigns like that. Weirdly, the Huntsman family experienced something similar when they were running for president because they have adopted children as well. And I think um, my father was actually never meant to be president. I think he's more powerful and influential as a senator in the role that he had. I think he was more of a maverick. Um, I think that his personality the way it is, I actually think he was most effective and most powerful in the roles that he had, and my family is completely at peace with both elections, but it was very hard to be young and to go through that and to sort of try and understand what was going on and understand why and really you know, start reconciling with racism and really the ugly dark side of right. politics. But I think, I think that there's been a lot of atonement since, and I think we should just learn from that mm -hmm. moment and move on. But I, that's basically what happened in South well, Carolina. Let me, let me elaborate on that because I'm mm -hmm. not sure Megan would even remember this, but um, there was a moment in the South Carolina campaign. And it was a very, very difficult campaign, and we went in winning the campaign and, and obviously came out losing it. But we all knew, the Bush campaign and ours, that whoever won South Carolina right. was going to be the nominee of the party. And, and we went in throwing punches. They went in throwing punches. Um, uh, and um, it, was, it was a tough campaign, and which was unusual because right prior to that, there had been no negative campaigning in North Carol or in right. New Hampshire. Right. Um, so this, was, this went bad fast. There was a day in the middle of this three-week campaign that was the South Carolina campaign where we had this town hall, and the town halls were huge. And a woman came to the town hall, and as all town halls, she ate, at, raised her hand, and she was like the last question of the day. And she said, Senator McCain, um, you know, my son, who's 13 years old, um, it reveres you. He's got uh, your posters up in his, in his room, and he, he really hopes that you'll be President of the United States someday. But he got a disturbing phone call talking about how you're a cheat and a liar. And, uh, and, and he, was, he came downstairs crying because of the nasty things that people were saying to him on the telephone. And Senator, you've got to do something you know, about the tone and tenor of this campaign. And she became an instant overnight celebrity on the evening news. Um, we were all going up to New York for a fundraiser, uh, the mother's milk of American politics. Um, I think Phil Graham might have coined that phrase, uh, another great Texas politician and good friend of John McCain's. And, um, and McCain tells me, he's like, I want to pull all the negative ads. And, um, and I had no idea what that would really mean. And we were in the suite before the, the, the event, and Megan was in there. Hmm. And I came back in, and I appealed to him one more time. I said, Senator, if we pull these ads, you're going to lose South Carolina. There's no way to win a campaign that's as tough and hard as this one in South Carolina by going positive. And we had about a week to go, and so it was critical time. And he turned to Megan, and he said, I want to run a campaign my daughter can be proud of. 
And that tells you something. Mm -hmm. He was willing to lose the chance for the presidency in order to do it the right way. You know, I find... He has such integrity almost to his detriment. I mean, his, his morals and convictions and the code he lives by, he lives by. And I try to do it. It is not. <laughs> and if he just doesn't, and that's it exactly exemplifies it. He said, I, I, I'd rather run an honorable campaign and lose than you know, run a dishonorable a nasty campaign, winning campaign and win. Uh, but, but, but the amazing thing, you talk about atonement, Megan. One of the things he does the same year that he loses the nomination is he atones for his own sin mm. in South Carolina yep. by saying, when I was asked uh, whether the, the Confederate flag should fly above the Capitol, I supported it. Because I thought if I didn't support it, I would lose South Carolina, and I regret that. Mm -hmm. That's a remarkable moment in and of itself. That, that just it conceding that he had done the wrong thing even after he had lost. He had, there was no reason for him to go back and, right. and concede that that was the wrong thing to do. He brings yeah. it up when, he, when people ask him, have, you know, have you ever regretted any actions? Have you ever thought of any mistakes? When the HBO crew came to our house, he had just been diagnosed, which you know, it's so him to be like, I'm diagnosed with cancer, let's document it right now in every way. <laughs> um, but he, one of the things they asked was, what do you regret? And he talked about that for a long time. Mm. I wanna say like a half hour, 45 minutes, and. Of course, he it was wrong. He admits it was wrong, but he he almost obsesses over the things that he has done wrong versus the so many amazing things he's done right. Right, right. Two. So he runs again in eight years after the Bush presidency, uh, but it's a very different campaign. If uh, 2000 and the Straight Talk Express was was open and he was so accessible, uh, 2008 was something altogether different. What changed? Well, I think a lot of uh, the culture around the media changed. So what distinguished the, the 2000 campaign was the free and open access to the media. Um, all those reporters we had in the back of the bus were no longer traveling on campaigns. And, and like it or not, it, the, the bus was full of people, young people with cameras that were streaming the video. And their interest wasn't to learn about the, the, the way a, a candidate would want to govern the nation, but to get the gotcha thing out on the internet as quick as they could. And so we rapidly found out that the discourse that was so powerful and meaningful in the 2000 campaign actually could not occur uh, in the modern media era that, that, that we have. And so, so that had to get shut down. I mean, we, we couldn't blow through um, you know, the gotcha journalism, uh, which was unfortunate because it took a lot of the joy for Senator McCain out of the campaign, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just that interaction. And, uh, and we also thought, well, you know, uh, George Bush beat us by building this big campaign with lots of resources and smart people, and we just had this band of pirates. We don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so we did that. We built a big campaign with lots of people and rapidly went broke and got unpopular <laughs> fast. <laughs> right. And, right. Uh, and so the campaign collapsed under its own weight. Nobody really um, uh, did it to us but ourselves. Mm -hmm. But like John McCain, I mean, he, he looks at that as opportunity. It was an amazing moment where everything that could go wrong has gone wrong in the campaign. He went from number one to number nine. He mm -hmm. went from having all the money to being in debt. Yeah, all the support to no support. This was in the primary. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what was interesting is he went off uh, uh, during that summer to Iraq with Lindsey Graham. He's the only guy I know who wants a break and goes to a war zone. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. And, and he, it was a wonderful experience for him there. Uh, General Petraeus had just taken over command of the Iraq war. He was pushing for a surge. More troops to put into an unpopular war. Uh, the Johnson family knows quite a bit about mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and, and he's there with Lindsey Graham, and one of the things they traditionally do, and he, he'd go to there quite often, 20 times in about a five-year period, um, they do uh, uh, ceremonies where they're uh, re-upping uh, for the military, but also becoming U.S. citizens. One of the great things about our U.S. military is if you're an immigrant and you want to become a citizen of the United States, you join the military and you get a fast track. Uh, but you've got to put your life at risk. And in this case, um, on this day, there were about a dozen uh, members of the, uh, the U.S. military getting inducted as citizens of the United States. 
and John and Lindsay were there, but there were two seats in the front row with boots on them. The day before, in the Battle of Fallujah, those two young men gave their life for the country in order to become citizens. They were inducted that day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and John looked at Lindsay and said, if they can give their life for our country, I can go back to the stinking campaign and suck it up for another couple of months. And um, it's exactly what he did. He started carrying his own bags to New Hampshire. Mm. We, we mm -hmm. lived off the land again. The pirate ship floated. And, uh, and another miracle of New Hampshire where John McCain right. was able to pull out a huge victory against all odds and, and in this case, sailed a victory. And ultimately copped the nomination, yeah. W one of the most indelible moments in that campaign and one of my favorite political moments, period, uh, comes at a campaign rally where a woman... Uh, comes up to Senator McCain and, and, and says that she can't trust Barack Obama because he's an Arab. And he says, no, ma'am. He's a decent family man, a citizen that I just happen to disagree with on fundamental issues. It's an incredible moment of, of civility and decency. Megan, you alluded in your, your remarks that we, we live in a very divided America. Are we capable of a moment like that today Be well, between the parties? First, I want to say that moment. I can't go four days without someone bringing it up to me. Mm -hmm. I had a cab driver the other day recognize me and was like, do you know that moment in your dad's campaign? And instead of saying the same thing. So well, for whatever reason, that moment really has, has hit a nerve with Americans, especially, I think, at this moment in time. I am always going to be a America is a shining beacon on top of the hill girl. I am never going to get down in the mud and believe that this kind of you know, anger and division is going to be our future forever. I can't live like that. I, can't, I, I have to believe in the optimistic message that my father has built his entire career on. I think we're in a dark place. I will say that when you're talking about the 08 campaign, I... I understand the anger that's in America right mm -hmm. now. I understand why people are so angry. When you're talking about the media in general, you know, it, there's a lot of people in the media that I don't think really understand what's going on in the country and haven't taken the time to leave D.C. and to leave Washington and to leave New York and go actually talk to voters. And I think it kind of started then. So I, I think we in the media, and that's myself as well, have to take culpability for what's going on right now, not just politicians. And I do think we are hitting a tipping point where people, I mean, people just applauded that moment. I do mm -hmm. think there's a craving for bipartisanship, for uh, toning down of the anger. I mean, my God, there was a shooting yesterday in a, in a newspaper. I mean, we're hitting a really dangerous moment right now. And I, I really hope that we start rolling it back and start seeing just the America that I think so many of us want to continue to, to go forth in the future. Um, I wonder, the, the term fake news, we had Jake Tapper here actually uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about this. The term fake news has become part of the vernacular. But is the media any less credible now than, say, in 2000 when they boarded the, the, you know, the, the, the Straight Talk Express? You know, I, I, I think that it's a, it's a different kind of media, right? I think things have changed so much. Um, um, you know, back in 2000, you still had fact-checking, right? I mean, people would look at your proposals and say, well, this is a fact and this is not. Now we just make up our own facts. And if it's not true, it ought to be. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 literally, um, there's no authoritative outlet that sets a standard uh, that you can say, oh, I trust that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so I think it's a bigger challenge for politicians uh, than it used to be uh, where, you know, you sort of had bumpers, right? You know, it's, it's like the old uh, driving game where you get into the, you know, the bumpers and you bang around and you go as fast as you want to go because you know you're not going to go off the rails. There are, no ra there are no bumpers anymore. You can go right off the rails and, and, and still be in the race. And, and that's what's happening today I think, in, in the media. I, I wouldn't want to be running campaigns today because the standards uh, don't exist. You know? mm -hmm. and, and even in places like South Carolina, you know, during that very difficult campaign in, 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 in 2000, you know, where it seemed like 
It was getting dark fast. Yeah. The media was trying to understand the truth. You know, they were trying to actually report what, uh, what was going on uh, to try and create some standard uh, by which people could, could know what was the truth and what wasn't the truth. And now I'm not sure uh, you would have that kind of support from the media uh, if, if you needed it. Uh, I think that they would report what's being said without any uh, uh, reference to whether or not it's true or not. And there was actually a moment uh, during that campaign in South Carolina where a reporter, CNN reporter, was interviewing a professor from Bob Jones University uh, about a, one of the flyers that had been circulated was that John McCain had a family in prison camp. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they have a lot of that going on in the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, and um, and, and, and the, the professor actually said, well, uh, I think the senator should prove that it's not true. In other words, you got to prove the neg just prove right, the negative. Right. And and I mean, first of all, I called the CNN reporter and said, "Why the hell would you interview that man? I mean, like, you gave him free airtime to make up a story that now people are going to say, gee, I wonder if that's true or not.' But but I think that's part of what has to happen in the media now is the right. media's got to look inward, not outward. We're not the problem. Yeah. The media's the the got to have a standard set where they say, you know, we got to start patrolling this stuff ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Stay with 2008 for a moment. Uh, I have to ask. I have to ask with respect. Um, did Senator McCain's choice of Sarah Palin as his running mate lead to a rise in God, we're Almost done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. I got you. I got you. You want to take this? I'll take it, Rick. Right. Don't worry. But did did, uh, did, did, it, did it make? Yeah. Populism more mainstream by bringing to prominence somebody with a, a more populist message. So first thing I want to say is my father could have chosen Jesus Christ as his running mate, and he still would have lost. Number one, I do believe there was too, there was yeah, so we much. We needed a woman. Yes, we need we <laughs> needed a woman, but there was so much uh, momentum on President Obama's side. Yeah. I do believe when you're talking about the media and you're talking about spin, and there are statistics to back this up. It's not just me pontificating here. That when you have uh, overwhelmingly positive coverage of one candidate. For the overwhelmingly negative coverage of another candidate. That's the information the American public is consuming. And I do think that pushed the scale a little bit. Obviously, we can talk about the not amazing campaign that was run and all these things. But I think too much blame is put on Sarah, and I don't think it's fair. Mm -hmm. When I first met her, I was intensely inspired by her because I had never seen um, a young mom in politics before. Her child, Trig, was, I think, six months old, yep. a, a mm -hmm. baby. I had never seen a woman um, feeding a child as a, a sitting governor and an obviously vice presidential candidate. I still have great affection for her. And I, I, it makes me sad that there seems to be a division uh, between in the media that's been presented between my family and her. I will say that the pop, the rise of populism, which is something I talk about almost every day on The View, sure. almost every day trying to explain why this happened, I don't think you can place the blame on her. I think that she showed a different side of the Republican Party, which I'm the first person to say is not really my side, but it mm -hmm. doesn't make it less relevant. It doesn't make the anger that's going on in the country less relevant. These people want their perspective shown, and she mm -hmm. showed a different side of the party, and I don't think it's fair to blame her for Trump in any way. Well, yeah, let me, let me yeah, just please. elaborate on that, because there's a historical imperative, too, yeah. here. The, the, there has always been, and always will be, a, a group of Republican voters who tend toward populism. Right? Ross Perot plugged into that in 1992 and helped mm -hmm. defeat George W. H. W. Bush because of the economic populism that he was espousing that, was, that pulled voters out of the Republican Party uh, in that national election. And, and then in 1996, um, Pat Buchanan mm -hmm. was just like that. And, and yet he, he expanded it to have social populism. Right. And um, people forget Pitchfork Pat, you know, uh, beating uh, 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 Bob Dole in Republican primaries as the last man standing with about 25% of the vote, right? So you could do well with about 25% of the vote. He, was, he right. survived longer than Phil Graham did, who was arguably one of the smartest people in American politics. So, so this brand of populism existed in the Republican Party from the get-go. Now, what's happened in the past is we tend to consolidate our party nominees quickly 
and we don't have three or four man races that divide it up to where someone who's getting 30% of the vote can win a lot of primaries. Mm -hmm. That's the difference that happened in this last election. Mm -hmm. so, so Sarah Palin is no more the creator of, you know, Tea Partyism was just like uh, Ross Pro or Pat, Rob, Pat Buchanan and even a little brand of Pat Robertson. So, so we've got this. It's a very new thing to sort of like somehow say this is all brand new to our party. You know, people who have run races, we've had to sidestep voters in this area in order to elect, quote, establishment politicians. Um, right. I can't believe John McCain today is being called an establishment politician. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and yet because he won a nomination, he became an establishment politician. Yeah. Also, yeah. when you look back, especially in the recent race in 2016, Jeb Bush blew $100 million. You know, and if, again, it's not about money anymore. It's about messaging. And I think that President Trump's messaging resonated with a lot of people in a way that I, I don't pretend to completely understand all the time because I have my family obviously are like the Hatfields and McCoys right now between his family and mine. But it's, it's I don't know, I, I think we need to be more compassionate to, to voters. One of the things that none of us understood, I think I, I can speak for, I know I can speak for you and I can speak for this audience, um, is, is Donald Trump saying your father was not a war hero. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he drew the ire of so many Americans and yet sailed on to win the nomination. He apparently called you yeah. to tell you that he was no longer going to disparage your father. How did that all occur? Well, I was with my husband in our uh, house in Alexandria, and I, I was in the shower, and I came out, and I got a voice message that said, President Trump would like to speak with you. Please call this number. And I was like, Oh no! Like I don't know what I did, <laughs> and I called my dad and I said, "What do I do?" And he said, "You call him. He's the president of the United States." And um, I had a very lovely conversation with him and Melania. Um, he was very complimentary of my father. I was under the impression that we were going to be, and I called you and said, "I think I think we're going to be. I think we're going to put this behind us. I think that." You know, I, his comments are never going to be okay with me, especially at this moment in my life. I sure. mean, it's, it's, I'm never going to forgive it. I'm never going to move on from it personally. But I'm a political commentator, and I'm trying to call balls and strikes like I see them in this administration. And then uh, I said publicly that I, I think it's going, I think we're going to at least have some, pe some mea culpa. And then um, I, not even a month later, he said something disparaging at a rally, and I mm -hmm. don't remember what state. And... Uh, now, I, if anyone wants to say anything to me in any way, they have to do it publicly. I don't take private phone calls from the Trump administration anymore. How do you reconcile? And I, and I mean that. I mean that. I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. Huh? Kelly Sadler, like, don't call me. You can call Brick. Don't call me. <laughs> you can call me. Are you, we're on national television. You can look in the camera. <laughs> Uh, how do you reconcile that change? What, 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 is he just incapable of, of not attacking? I don't, I don't pretend to understand it because it, to me it's just a bizarre thing to attack too. Someone's military service is yeah. a really bizarre thing to, to have any offense towards. Um, I will say that my family no longer cares. We are in a place where I want to focus on positivity and loving life and beating cancer. And uh, he, I mean, he just said something a few days ago and people were texting it to me and I was like, we don't care anymore. I got it. You, you don't like us. It's okay. Uh, my family and my father's legacy, as you just have seen, really stands for itself and he will be remembered for forever, I believe. And I think his, especially his military legacy will be remembered forever and that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's fine. I think that you can't, and thank you, that's very kind, but I really want to focus on what's great about America, what's great about my father, and just being as positive as possible. And it's, it's very difficult as a challenge, but it's just not worth getting in the mud anymore. Mm -hmm. It has not served me well in any way, being angry and being upset. All that I care about is loving my father and being there for him. So what you, when you look at America now, there's a, there's... Thanks. <laughs> What gives you hope when you look at America? I mean, my dad, as like cheesy as it sounds, um, I think um, even just the moment this evening, seeing the letters between my grandmother and President Johnson, there's still so much good in America. I cannot leave my apartment and get a bagel without someone saying nice. 
something nice about my father. I really can't. I mean, everywhere I go, someone has something wonderful to say about my father. And while he is in treatment for brain cancer, it's, an, it's a really incredible experience. My life is so filled with blessings. And America was always great. Yeah. And it's always going to be great. And I don't need reminding that there's some weird future where America wasn't the greatest country in the history of history, which I believe. And I don't know. I, I have the luxury of having John McCain as a father. So True. I always have something to believe in. Yeah. Um, the, the Steve Schmidt, who worked beside you, Rick, oh. uh, uh, on the camp, <laughs> camp base, is, he, he has renounced uh, his uh, membership in the Republican Party, his affiliation. George Will is advocating voting for Democrats. What is the future of John McCain's Republican Party? So, uh, look, John McCain's Republican Party uh, has its ups and downs, right? I mean, you know, but the, the, the fundamentals, I mean, John likes to say the party he belongs to is Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and Ronald Reagan. Now, there's a, there's a pretty big group of guys with ideas that I would say the vast majority of America on any given day would want to assemble behind. And, 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 and that's a history of our party that, that we need to cling to. I would now add John McCain to that list, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and if I'm a young, hungry political leader, regardless of where you are in America or what kind of job you have, I would want to look at John McCain's life mm -hmm. and say, gee, that's the guy I want to emulate. That's the attitude that I should have in politics, you know, to be able to go across the aisle and, and create change. Every major piece of legislation that John McCain passed, he did it on a bipartisan basis. Every major bill that comes out of the Armed Services Committee, where he's chairman, the, the, called the National Defense Authorization Act, which is now named after John McCain, right. the McCain Authorization Act, has been passed overwhelmingly in Congress and in a 100% vote out of his committee with Republicans and Democrats. Why people cannot look at that model and say, God, if that works for John McCain, why wouldn't that work for all of us? Mm. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, people come into the LBJ Library and they're just astounded by the legislative record of Lyndon Johnson. We showed some of uh, Senator McCain's legislative accomplishments in, in a slide before the program. What do you think he's most proud of legislatively? It's tough. Yeah, I, well, I, I think even the most recent thing, uh, last year, in the midst of you know, this health crisis that he's going through, um, he was able to pass landmark reorganization of the Defense Department. I would say if there's one thing that he cares more about than anything else is the safety and equipment of the US military. Mm -hmm. You know, they. He understands how important it is for our fighting men and women to have the necessary tools to be able to do their job in a safe fashion. Mm -hmm. And he has seen the decline of the military over his time in a way that was just alarming to him. And he felt passionately that he had to do something about it. When he got the reins of the chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee, he passed in a year ago the, the National Defense Authorization Act that actually was finally fully funded because he was able to break the chains of sequestration that have kept defense funding at a very low level. And we're just now seeing the benefits of that. I mean, one of the things that was just one of the greatest shocks to John McCain was the USS McCain, a battleship named after his father and his grandfather, you know, was involved in an accident. And, and, and the argument has been made, and he would say it's true, that part of the problem we're having these accidents is because we're not training our troops enough and we don't have the budget to do it. And so, so those are the things I think he cares most about. He, he fought passionately uh, to get that bill passed and to find the funding, an additional $80 billion a year that they weren't getting that they needed in the budget last year. And he did it in the middle of a horrible health crisis. Mm -hmm. And I, I must say, uh, I think he would have to argue today that, that it's probably one of the greatest accomplishments of his life, and it's the last bill that he, that he will have been involved in you know, prior to getting cancer. So it's amazing. There's a relatively recent CBS poll uh, taken in Arizona, which reflects uh, an approval rating of, I believe, 70 percent. But, but uh, 20, only 20 percent of Republicans approve, and 62 percent of Democrats approve of Senator McCain's performance. 
it, it, at this day and age, given the political spectrum, is he considered more Democrat than Republican, do you think? <laughs> look, he's John McCain. <laughs> you can't put a party label on that guy. Um, look, I was involved with his reelection in 2016. Same time we had a presidential campaign going on, John McCain was up for reelection. And, and, and Arizona's Republican Party is a very conservative very. Republican Party, yeah. probably as conservative as any party uh, there is. Uh, he won a 14-point victory in a, in a hotly contested Republican primary. So, you know, I, no disrespect to pollsters. I hate pollsters. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no disrespect. <laughs> no disrespect. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, that was when it mattered. There, when there was a campaign going on and there was a fight for ideas, and his ideas were overwhelmingly adopted. Now, he also won a landslide victory for the general election where he got a majority of the Hispanic vote in Arizona, which is predominantly Democratic. He got actually almost a majority of the Democratic vote that voted for him. So you imagine this. Donald Trump is on the ballot in Arizona at the same time John McCain is. Donald Trump won the state by 4%, and John McCain won the state by 14%. Um, so, so he's always had an eclectic uh, uh, background. We took a poll once in 2000, and Republicans, independents, and Democrats all had the same approval rating for him, which was over 50%. Um, you know, it's, we're entering a period of time now where we elect national office holders who don't have an overall positive approval rating. When John McCain ran in 2008 um, against Barack Obama, it was a tough campaign. John McCain's approval rating at the end of that campaign was 56%, and Barack Obama's was 57%. The American public liked both those guys, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't that you, one was bad and the other was good. Right. People made a choice, and it was an okay choice, right? They, they, they could have taken either one of these guys. After that, we have not elected a president that has been, had a positive approval rating on election day. Now, that's, that is an indication that either there's something sort of rotten in politics or these pollsters really are as bad as I think they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there somebody you see uh, who is a future John McCain? Oh, God. No. John McCain in the dress? No. <laughs> what do you think? No. Please stop. This is <laughs> killing me, Small, seriously. You just want to run another campaign. You just want to work with another McCain. Give me a break. Every other campaign's boring. You want to work with another one. Uh, no, I mean, it's, I'm really, I mean, um, Ben Sass, I like a lot. Mm -hmm. Center from Nebraska. Uh, oh, An so LBJ fans. school professor, yes. former LBJ school yeah. professor. They're, yeah, they're out there. I mean, I think at this particular moment, it's, you know, it, Trump is so popular among the Republican Party. I think don't think people feel as comfortable or courageous to reach out and uh, speak their truth. But I I don't know. I'm still hopeful. I'm still hopeful for the, full for the future. Mm. But I don't know. I mean, I don't want to put a pessimistic tone. There's not really one person that I think. Look, I, I, I think that sometimes we get mesmerized by national politics and the presidency specifically, right? One of the greatest things for your party is to win the presidency and to have all that power. And one of the worst things for your party is to win the presidency and your entire party is defined by one person, right? right? That, I mean, it's, right. it's just a fact. That's how it works. And, and so we have a robust party. We have all these great governors. We have legislative uh, leaders who are fantastic, working hard at the local level. We have some great senators, great congressmen. And our entire party is defined by one individual. So, right. um, you know, look, having been around almost as long as Governor Barnes, um, uh, I have a tendency to believe in the cycles, uh, you know, going uh, through. And we're in a, we're in a cycle. And it's, a, it's, it's not a great cycle to be in, but these cycles end, and we find new things to do and new leaders to back. And I think we'll have a good cycle in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your lips to God's ears. And working for John McCain, you have to be an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> Megan, how do you want your father to be remembered? Um, this is a hard question. And I was asked it earlier by some yeah. local Texas reporters. Um, I think his legacy speaks for himself, but I just, I want him to be remembered as a true statesman, which I think he is. I want him to be known as a war hero and someone who never did what was easy in politics. He always did what he thought was right and best for America and for being the maverick, for being one of the great all-time politicians ever, which he is and will always be. And 
I don't know, he's a really easy person to be inspired by every day, and especially even now with his battle with cancer, he shows such bravery and such fearlessness in the way that he approaches everything and even just experiencing, I thought I had experienced everything I could possibly experience with my father in this past year. I took four months off of work and was with him when he was diagnosed and he was going through treatment and the, the incredible stamina, courage, optimism he still has even when he's battling a dangerous disease is insurmountably inspiring yeah. and he's just, I don't know, I, I, I really hope he's not the last of his kind because he's really just, I don't know, I mean, I'm so biased, I'm his daughter, but he's just the best of the best of the best and he loves America in a way that is, is just so truly touching and inspiring. He just loves this country so much and I mean, you've been, you've been through it, you've seen it firsthand too, Rick. He's just, you know, he's the eternal optimist about America. Yep. Well, I wanna... I w I want to thank you both for being here. And um, I think I speak for the audience. What I, I want to thank your friend uh, and your father for his remarkable service to our country. Thanks thank very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. And thank you so much to the Johnson family. Thank you.